Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for this very special pre-launch of The Unremembered Nation, two volumes on community and livelihood art and ideals. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker and author, Dasho Kamaura, uh, our distinguished commentators, Sir Simon Bowes-Lyon and Professor Ulrika uh, Rosler, and Sabina Alkaya, who will moderate the commentary and the ensuing discussions. Uh, there's something a little odd about this as a book launch, which you might have noticed, which is that we don't actually have any books. Uh, normally, you'd expect there to be a table with all the nice signed copies for you to uh, take home with you in a nice paper bag. Um, the reason for that is that this is a pre-launch, and the book is going to be published by the OUP in August of this year. So why are we jumping the publication gun? Uh, the reason is that uh, Dr. Ura is a visiting scholar in Oxford until mid-July, uh, thanks to the university's Public Policy Challenge Fund. And we did not want to miss this very special opportunity to celebrate our distinguished alumnus while he's here. And we have the chance to do it properly. Dr. Ura read PPE at Magdalen in the early 1980s. He continued his studies in Edinburgh and then worked for the Bhutanese Ministry of Planning for 12 years. His achievements since that time have spanned a truly astonishing range and depth of accomplishments, both intellectual and cultural. Dr. Ura became the founding director of the Centre for Bhutan Studies and Gross National Happiness from its opening in the late 1990s and remains so uh, until the present day. The CBS now gathers over 100 researchers drawn from all ministries across government under one roof. Following the leadership of His Majesty the Fourth King of Bhutan, who observed that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product, Dr. Ura has spearheaded Bhutan's conceptualization, measurement and practical application of the idea of gross national happiness, uh, both in government policy and in the private sector. In addition, Dr. Ura was a member of the drafting committee for Bhutan's first constitution, enacted in July 2008, and has been awarded the red scarf and the ancient title of distinction Dasho uh, for his distinguished service to his country. In 2010, Dr. Ura was granted the honor of Druk Korlo, the wheel of the Dragon Kingdom, for his contributions to literature and fine arts as a poet, a novelist, and more. He has composed a special uh, Tsechu, or annual spiritual festival, celebrated in Dorchula, involving dance choreography, costume and mask design and crafting, and musical composition, expressing a spiritual narrative. As an artist, Dr. Ura's works include wall murals for the temple in Dorchula, which depict the history of Bhutan, an image of Vajrayogini held in the British Museum, and massive modern-day interpretations of the founder of the nation and his consort for the five-story uh, Ji Chenkur Central Courtyard. Dr. Dr. Ura is the author of many books, ranging from policy analyses, such as deities, archers, and planners in an era of decentralization, beneficial labor contribution, a proposal for GNH value education in schools, and a compass towards a just and harmonious society. He's also uh, published a history book, Leadership of the Wise Kings of Bhutan, and numerous articles. He holds a doctorate from Nagoya University in Japan. Uh, he has also told me that he has the ability to hold his breath for an astonishingly long period of time. I will not ask him to demonstrate uh, this afternoon, uh, at least not until after dinner. Uh, after many years, we are absolutely delighted that Dr. Ura has returned to Magdalen, now as an honorary member of our senior common room, as well as a visiting fellow in the Department of International Development. So please will you join me in welcoming Dasho Kama Ura to introduce his most recent two-volume set, the Unremembered Nation. Thank you, Edina, for that very kind uh, uh, introduction. Indeed, uh, 
a little bit in excess of myself. <laughs> uh, I was here briefly uh, in 2019, uh, but otherwise uh, it's been 37 years since I left uh, college. Uh, and uh, 37 years ago, I remember, was a wonderful place. It was such a wonderful, but also a very mysterious place for me when I first arrived. And I was stunned at that time by a lot of things. Uh, having to write uh, essays uh, so regularly and then uh, talk to the tutors was also very mysterious for me. Uh, at that time, uh, I had a vague notion that uh, the teachers, tutors here were like reincarnate lamas. Uh, expert in scriptures and expert in realization. Uh, so that was sort of my own uh, mysterious projection part. Uh, but it was uh, slightly different uh, when there were glasses of wine in front, uh, especially she. And uh, uh, one such regular occasion where uh, we could get free drinks uh, with a discussion about philosophy was with Dr. Ralph Walker, uh, who is right behind. Uh, and it's very nice to see him. I mean, he's a kind of a main continuity of the college in that sense. And uh, I should say that long may he serve the college. Uh, it's very memory restoring for me to be back. Uh, my attitude was to suppress memories and get on with work, because I thought I would never be back here. And so uh, when I met a few of my batchmates, like David over there, uh, he said that it's like waking up from Bardo. Uh, Bardo, <laughs> Bardo is interlude in the stream of consciousness between uh, death and rebirth. So, but it's very nice to meet in uh, meet as a real person rather than sort of imagination of Bardo. Uh, so I'm very glad about this uh, aspect of one's life. Uh, some sort of a strange but happy circularity. And uh, when I came here as a visiting fellow at the kind initiative of Professor Sabina. Uh, this was not planned, uh, and this was not planned at all. So uh, the fact that it is synchronizing like this is also very, very pleasant for me. Uh, so uh, overall, this event in Modlin is really a great honor for me. And thank you so much, uh, Dina, uh, President of Modern College, for this very, very kind consideration. And also, I'd like to thank all the people who worked uh, in the background uh, for organizing this. Uh, Anna Morales and uh, Malone uh, in the alumni management. Uh, I should thank uh, Professor Ulrike uh, for being present too. Uh, and I'm very grateful to all of you who have come although in the last minute there was some change in venue and it may have caused you a little bit of inconvenience. I must say that the uh, college uh, looms a little bit larger than you might imagine in Bhutan because His Majesty the King went to, uh, came to study here. Uh, that's, that's why uh, in the uh, sort of thinking in Bhutan is bigger than it may sound. When he was crown prince, he was here. And the previous uh, president of Modlin College, Sir David Clare, mentioned that uh, there was, there's, there's only one student who studied here, a prince, who became uh, king. And the other was uh, Prince Edward VIII, he said. Uh, so it's very wonderful to have some sort of continuity between Bhutan and the college in some ways. And, uh, uh, though the species of creatures are 
very different and unlikely to cooperate in one painting in Bhutan, very, very common painting of four friends. Uh, it is uh, shown as possible. So across uh, thousands of kilometers and different culture to have something like this is really uh, very, very uh, satisfying. Uh, in that regard, uh, Sir Simon Boslein, uh, who is chair of the Bhutan uh, UK Friendship Society, as well as a distinguished alumni of this college, and Professor Sabina Alkair here, who is currently the chair of International uh, uh, Society for Bhutan Studies, uh, and an intellectual contributor to GNH, uh, they have provided uh, some sort of uh, continuity, uh, solid one, between UK and Bhutan in general and uh, between Maudlin College and uh, Bhutan in particular. Now as regards the book uh, for which uh, your kind presence is greatly appreciated, it's truly a humble publication, I must say. Uh, so the value of the presence you all bring to this occasion, uh, led by the president of Modeling College, Sir Simon Postline and Professor Ulrike and uh, Sabina, is uh, disproportionately uh, huge and generous. Uh, it is uh, really a very easy book, uh, if I may refer to the two volumes in the singular, um, because there are no high theories, there are no uh, sort of uh, big concepts in this. Uh, anyone can pick it up. I like to think it as some sort of newspaper. Uh, you can pick it up, poke it around, read a little bit, uh, but there is no necessity to read the next chapter also. It's, uh, so uh, it's a very simple book. Uh, but it is uh, slightly different uh, from uh, any uh, publication uh, on the region, the Himalayas. Uh, what you see uh, in the readings on any Himalayan state of past or the present is uh, uh, that if you go back into the past, what you see is the diffusion of Buddhism heavily influenced by politics or alternatively, politics heavily influenced by diffusion of Buddhism. That's basically uh, the sort of uh, uh, majority of the work on the Himalayan. Uh, now, if you come to the present contemporary Himalayan states, including Bhutan, uh, the reading frame is mostly economics. Uh, uh, so, uh, investment, revenue, taxation, growth, uh, banking, transport, media, health, education, uh, election, parties, democracy, and so on and so forth. So in that respect, it's very different, uh, the, uh, uh, the book. Uh, now, in fact, a life of civil servant, uh, including myself, really has uh, gone by in dabbling in these sort of economic issues. Most of the time, I'm doing work on this sort of thing. Uh, and in this regard, uh, the PP uh, Maudlin scholarship granted to me uh, in the early 80s has been uh, really good at uh, making me, uh, or giving me some capacity in this regard. So I'm really grateful beyond words to uh, Maudlin College. Uh, the book we are launching uh, today is about Again, why I say it's so simple is that it's uh, really about activities. Uh, one might add that it's about important activities of very unimportant people, ordinary people. Uh, ordinary people who have been changing, uh, their lifestyle has changing, their meaning values are changing as elsewhere in the Himalayas. So, uh, since it is about unimportant people, uh, you can expect it's quite uh, mundane uh, and quite possibly boring also. Uh, but I felt a sort of urge uh, to portray a disappearing world of ordinary people. Uh, in the book, I really stay uh, firmly away from uh, 
prescribing anything for anybody. Uh, my motivation was always to ask, how did the ordinary people experience their life in this or that context, during this or that event? And how did they experience uh, the consciousnesses of sound, smell, taste, tactility, and of mental consciousness? So overall, I think that it was a tough world, a tough world uh, inhabited by uh, deeply connected people. And that is also one endeavor in the current construction or structuring of the state, how to keep the communities deeply connected. So it was like that before, and they were also not deeply connected, but also much closer to animals, uh, much closer to animals. And they were walking vast distances uh, every year, even if that was a child. Uh, I myself, uh, from the age of six or so, started uh, participating in migration, annual migrations. And living uh, uh, with much greater sense of absurdities and sense of mirth. Uh, in the book, there is a liberal amount of old folk songs, sayings, sarcasm, and some of the sense of absurdities uh, are reflected in the aphorism and satire I translate uh, in the book. Uh, but the songs and sayings uh, depend a great deal on the alliteration in Zonka, and that any translation find it difficult to bring it through in English, so uh, it looks absurd in English, <laughs> in a way. Uh, uh, I was very interested in the experience of sounds of uh, beasts and birds, uh, rivers and wind, uh, languages and uh, uh, dialects. Uh, Bhutan has about 18 dialects. Uh, of course, it is shrinking as functional languages now. Of the smells, uh, um, pervasive ones were herbal, incense, incense smoke offering, chili smell, and of course, fermented, fermented smell of alcohol, which I also sense very much in the pubs here. <laughs> I might add that the smell of long wall room I occupied on arrival, I thought for a long time that that was the British national smell. <laughs> uh, then in the mid-90s when hotels uh, came up in Bhutan, I actually smelled the same smell. So it was not really the national British smell. Uh, I'm sure that anyone who writes anything uh, on Himalayan Buddhist states will be very tempted to become conceptual and theoretical. Uh, but my uh, 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 small chapter on monks and monasteries uh, or on state power, I avoid going into a very serious things. I, when I discuss about monks and monasteries, uh, my attention is not aimed at all on Droktins or on legendary achievements or this Lama or that saint. Uh, I was not really interested very much in those. Uh, I wanted to provide really a view on very boring humdrum life of monks uh, in these monasteries. Uh, so there's a there are descriptions on uh, life of monks in relation to communal sanitation, uh, in relation to dining hall, uh, and common sleeping hall. Or when I discuss a little bit about the topic of Guru Rinpoche, for example, is a very uh, pervasive figure uh, in the Himalayas. No one can escape uh, without hearing or seeing something about Guru Rinpoche when you visit Himalayan states. Uh, even when I uh, discuss uh, him, my interest is not on why he is omnipresent over there, but my extent of my approach is very much limited to his influences on shaping language, 
on the shaping ordinary art and architecture, which are uh, very much alive today. And, and especially on his uh, legacy on shaping the perception of the inhabitants uh, towards nature. Uh, so I, uh, I, I stay away completely from the uh, hot topics of uh, relative truth versus absolute <laughs> truth, uh, conceptuality versus non-conceptuality, or nirvana versus samsara. <laughs> Now, besides Vajrayana Buddhism in the Himalayas, uh, there are at least two types of uh, beliefs, uh, uh, or two cults and faith, which also encompass uh, almost all inhabitants. One is the belief in what you might say earth gods, uh, local deities, who hold sway uh, over the localities. The other is the cult of a vegetarian space god or sky god. And uh, those who come from Tibet will probably have, you would have come across, Laodi Gungyal, Wadi Gungyal. This is even before Yudungbun. Uh, so every year in the festivals throughout Eastern Bhutan, uh, that is uh, majority of the Bhutanese population, uh, this space god is invited from the 13th level of the sky down to earth, and it descends on top of tree, the tree of God. But he and his entourage doesn't come below the tree, uh, tree top because it's considered contaminating to land on earth. Uh, already there's enough intimation about pollution in this story. Uh, and uh, uh, then the cord or thread is strung from the tree to human beings in order to receive the charges, renewal of uh, fertility, fecundity, potency, vitality for livestock and human beings. Uh, in this regard, and I was taking a walk, uh, thanks to uh, Dina making me a member of in a common room, I take a walk to Edison, and I visualize that the great plane tree here is suitable for that. Uh, and also, um, I, I just um, uh, noted here that the, the space god flies back after the festival. Until next year, you will re-invite, re uh, he is back in the 13th level of the sky. You have to visualize every time uh, the, each level how he goes back. Anyway, I thought that the only human being who has considered his death to be performed in Mars is Elon Musk. I thought he will like this story <laughs> very much. And, uh, uh, but uh, it presents a big problem for any of us who might like to attend his funeral. It will be very <laughs> expensive. Uh, I discussed a little bit about uh, things like laws, uh, regulations of uh, uh, medieval Bhutan, uh, but even when I do so, uh, the, the uh, corpus of laws that were promulgated in 1729, um, my interest is not about legal principles, jurisprudence, or uh, such high things, but really is a consideration of selected provisions that affect the ordinary people must, most. Uh, there were lots of regulations uh, from in the uh, 17, there are lots of regulations in 1729 legal code on transportation of official loads. Uh, numerous kinds of in-kind collections of goods and uh, foods. There were regular errands for people to perform um, in terms of maintenance of bridges, fortresses, uh, roads, and also obligation on tilling uh, official and monastic lands, as well as looking after official herds of cattle, yaks, and horses. There is in that law even an obligation on the people for each household to uh, nurse back and fatten two official horses per year. 
uh, which have, these horses have been driven, had been driven to sort of weakness or feebleness because of overworking. So they have to be uh, nursed back by households. I'm sure similar things can be found in the old histories of perhaps Nepal, Tibet. Anyway, I noted that this sort of practice is equivalent to sending defunct cars to Abingdon workshop without having to pay. Uh, so I'm coming to my last six, seven minutes. Please excuse me. Uh, when I discuss visual arts of iconography, which are there inside houses or temples, or when I discuss about exterior painting of the house, houses in Bhutan are heavily painted, uh, out even the, the exterior side. Uh, I just uh, did not want to focus only on the art and the artist. Really, I, I was uh, fascinated equally by the production process involved uh, and the materials. So I discuss not only the painters, but non-artists who do the plastering of the walls that make frescoes uh, possible. I discuss the excavators of colored earth. I discuss the backpack merchants who uh, do small business, petty business in rare minerals, and also the dyers of vegetable uh, colors. A little bit uh, conceptually oriented chapter is on visualization and the arts. And even there, a lot is on the detailed process of visualization of an uh, imagery that a lot of Buddhists do at one stage in their life. Or, uh, I thought it, this, this uh, detailed process of visualization is not found in uh, most of the Tibetan texts, I thought. Uh, so uh, here, uh, just to uh, resonate uh, Dina's point, the exercise of sustained, colorful, and dynamic visualization of imagery, imagery uh, that we have to construct, keep it stable, and then also deconstruct or minimize and disappear at will, uh, is a subject of a chapter. At the same time, uh, it takes up the question of modulation of breath while enjoying moment by moment arising of sensation of inhaled breath. This is really uh, minute uh, uh, part of the exercise. Anyway, I thought this would be interesting. Uh, a lot of people do yoga, but this is kind of mental yoga. Of course, uh, no Southeast Asian country could escape contact with the British. Uh, first with the East India Company and then later with the British Empire. Uh, so the same with uh, Bhutan, um, increasingly after uh, the turn of 18th century, uh, it came into contact with uh, the British Empire. And at first it was about what to do with this country as we want to get through to Tibet for trading. So it was about trade route. Uh, but later on, it became uh, an issue about alle alleged aggression by the Bhutanese on the British subjects. I'm sure you can sense the plot line. Uh, uh, so there was a very big clash in 1865 uh, between uh, Bhutan and the British forces. One side was or had howitzer guns, and the other side was pelting stones and uh, poisoned arrows. Uh, so uh, the result was that uh, uh, the row about about three thousand pounds is there recorded in the House of Common document. Uh, finally, led to capture of uh, three thousand five hundred square miles of land, which was very rich. Uh, in terms of uh, tea plantation, 
rice growing, elephant tusk, and timber. Uh, the story is based completely on British accounts because the Bhutanese uh, monks, writers, writers were mainly monks, uh, not interested in military accounts. And they thought this sort of uh, record keeping is also not helpful for Nirvana. So we did not keep any good account of a very important event in the history of Bhutan. But the culture of migration from Bhutan to Assam and some part of Bengal continued till 1950s. So the Bhutanese would come and stay three months in the borderlands of Assam uh, to sort of enjoy their winter. Uh, now, if you go into the cloud forest, like the Andes, Bhutanese forests are also cloud forest, uh, you see a lot of ruins of tall, rammed earth houses. Uh, this is the main method of con construction of houses in the past, uh, rammed earth uh, buildings. And occasionally you will come across large stone complexes which were castles. Archaeology is almost non-existent at the moment. Perhaps this could be a consideration of cooperation also. <laughs> Uh, between Oxford University and Bhutan. Uh, but the endurance and the long-lastingness of the rammed earth houses uh, really uh, interested me. So I did a little bit of work on uh, this. Uh, and I uh, really uh, uh, give, give, give an account of the rituals and uh, skills involved in building them and about spaces uh, where we spend so much of our life walking, sitting, lying, uh, or standing. Uh, these four categories are described by the Buddha. It's not my category, how we spend life. <laughs> uh, the houses, households, are matriarchal uh, in Bhutan. And the husband who come from outside uh, basically orbit around the houses doing all the uh, physical works. Uh, a lot of interest uh, there, I think. I saw some work from the Oriental Institute also done on this sort of structure of family, matriarchal structure. And the question always at the end is, in the past, were the women more powerful or men equally powerful? Or how do you adjudicate that? I really don't know. But uh, uh, the question really is about who is more powerful, foreign secretary or the home secretary? And I thought it depends on context to context. We could not make overall judgment uh, because neither of them are prime minister. <laughs> but what I'd like to bring to your uh, attention through this book is that there was a very unusual figure, shadowy figure behind the Home Secretary. So uh, behind Priti Patil, there was the maternal uncle packing her up completely, uh, who held a lot of implicit authority and power. Uh, uh, his role is uh, sung very much in aphorism in Bhutan. Uh, one uh, such uh, saying is, Asha Sham Chugi Baru Masung. Even if the maternal uncle is flown away by the current of the river, don't catch him by his skull, because his skull is very important. <laughs> if he can be saved, that sort of thing. Uh, so my, as my focus is on ordinary people, there's a lot of uh, uh, information on the intertwined existence of farming, livestock management, and wild animals. Uh, and animal husbandry, these four things really. Uh, so the skilled herdsmen who developed uh, in conjunction with perfection of breeding through pipe backcross breeding, this is, seems to be rather unusual thing, uh, uh, understanding developed in Bhutan. Uh, 
uh, how to breed with backcross uh, five generations. Uh, this is presented as the backbone of rural livelihood uh, in the past. But also this is uh, much sought after breed just now uh, in competition with Swiss, Swiss uh, Jersey, or, uh, Brown Swiss, or Jersey Cross. Uh, the practice of uh, has migratory animal uh, farming uh, is condemned in most of the literature I, I found actually. Uh, but this practice in Bhutan seems to have become very uh, sustainable because they, the, the herds moved over long distances, uh, never degrading a place, uh, precise uh, duration at precise location. And they would make a circuit throughout the year. Uh, so uh, degra degradation uh, of grazing never took place. Uh, uh, and uh, the modern uh, comparison is rotational grazing. grazing you know. uh, so it was a rotational grazing, but practiced on a very vast scale in Bhutan. And uh, when it comes to farming also, conventions uh, uh, of cooperative work applied uh, equally, uh, just like migration uh, of cattle required conventions uh, so that conflicts didn't take place. So although farmlands were private, major works were always done communally along with frequent communal feasting. And uh, this is very important, as you know, a lot, 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 lot of literature on social capital. I'm coming now, uh, I'm closing uh, by saying that food sharing was really the fuel uh, that kept social and political machinery running in Bhutan. And if you had visited Bhutan a few decades ago, myself as your host, what I would offer you? Among other dishes, the main one I would offer you is singed, roasted, and jelly cooked cattle or yak skin in mustard oil. Uh, skins and hides were uh, used, as you know, uh, in painting for hide glue, uh, you know, making pigment, but it was equally important also as social glue. So such kind of small uh, details fill the book. Uh, indeed, they are very small potatoes uh, from higher academic point of view. Or to use Bhutanese analogy, it will be called rat chilies, uh, because there are big chilies, small chilies, rat chilies. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, it does f fill up details um, towards a larger understanding of how people live lives differently. And I thank you very much for uh, your kind attention and presence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a clear and um, evocative description of the volumes and it is as he said peppered with facts one thing I learned I did not know about sharing food is that on average Bhutanese eat for 82 minutes a day and he had figured out it was four years of your life that you spend eating together so many many jewels of details I'm delighted to welcome our commentators and invite Sir Simon Bowes-Lyon to offer his reflections. He started life as a chartered accountant and worked in finance and in farming. And before entering Bhutan, he had already been collecting botanical species in the Himalayas and in the Hindu Kush. And then he was invited to go to Bhutan in the mid 60s. And he has become renowned for his studies on the flora of Bhutan with the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens and worked on that for well over a decade. And of interest and commendation also is that while all of the technical knowledge came <coughs> from the West initially, as years went on, the botanic leadership became Bhutanese. So our speaker seeded a legacy of both expertise and leadership in these topics. 
On the broader stage, he was, as Dashakarma Ura mentioned, with Michael Rutland and Lord Wilson of Tilliorn, co-founder of the Bhutan Society of the United Kingdom and remains its president. And he has maintained, therefore, deep contacts with all strata of society in Bhutan. And perhaps he is the most apt commentator on this book because his sojourn in Bhutan began when the book's curtains close and he saw the Bhutan it describes while the memories were vivid for the people he met, the characters and the traditions living, and the changes to come that we now see, mere dancing drops of imagination. So we look forward very much to your reflections. Well, uh, <clears throat> one thing you forgot to say was that I, I was at Maudlin. So uh, this, I, I do think uh, uh, one of the great things, we're, we're very fortunate of having a Karma's association with this college. Uh, and uh, 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 I long may that prosper and continue. Uh, but I should say that on one of my earlier visits to Bhutan, and we were visiting his old school, Kangung. And I think it was Father Leclerc. Anyhow, he said, I had to be honest, you see, about, uh, I was asked for a reference from Maudlin, and uh, I had to say that he was the most unsuitable candidate uh, because he thinks, thinks for himself and uh, he doesn't have a great respect for authority uh, and he, he he does cartoons of the staff and uh, anyhow the rest is history because <laughs> Maudlin immediately said that's our man and uh, so uh, and they were of course absolutely right um, <clears throat> Well, uh, my association with Bhutan, on the one hand, I really should say, when I uh, dip into uh, Karma's book, uh, is, re is very superficial. Uh, I hope it will be less superficial after reading all of it. Um, but what I think is less superficial is the influence that uh, Bhutan has had uh, on one's life uh, in so many ways. And um, you see, at, at one level, at the very high level, uh, you look at uh, Bhutan, the country, uh, and it's, you see a sort of microcosm uh, of so much that happens. Uh, to different nations in the world, uh, at a, a different low level, uh, it's very approachable uh, because the, the, the mutinies share uh, their culture and their ways with you uh, so that you're somehow included uh, in everything that... Uh, sort of goes on there with it really without knowing it and I think that gives one this marvelous sense of almost freedom when you go there uh, or it did on those very many visits years ago and I hope it would be the same today um, <coughs> you you feel that you're going to absorb so much of uh, what is going on. And <clears throat> I think the, uh, uh, the friendships that one has made over the years uh, have just been very valuable. Uh, so, um, what took me to uh, Bhutan originally uh, was, as has been said, uh, this botanical interest, which was something that 
uh, all just grows out of uh, earliest childhood. I always had my fingers dirty in the soil. Uh, and, uh, and so the interest in plants uh, took me there because I wanted to go as far east as possible in the, uh, uh, in the Himalaya and, and that extended in those days uh, to Sikkim and very barely Bhutan because it was made very difficult with inner line permits and, and all that sort of thing. However, uh, I can remember that we received the telegram from Bhutan saying that our permission to go has been refused, but come just the same. I think that's what's called a telegram en clair in <laughs> diplomatic terms. Uh, and uh, we, we just sailed in. Uh, now, over the, the years, uh, a substantial work in the inventory of the floor of Bhutan uh, took place in, in, basically in the 80s. As a result of uh, a lot of research and collections uh, over many years by many people, and I think that where this uh, has been so valuable uh, is because uh, it has um, drawn into uh, as the knowledge and the study of this very rich flora by the Bhutanese themselves. It's very fertile ground, uh, this, uh, when you try and talk about this subject. Uh, they, uh, uh, they are just instinctively and naturally interested, obviously not all of them, uh, but for enough of them. Uh, and I find on the last uh, trip or two, uh, it's not a question of pushing to go somewhere. I'm pulled uh, by uh, local botanists or people, foresters, uh, who share my interest. And so that has been... Um, that, that has been, I suppose, one of the benefits uh, of uh, the modern or the, the, the contact that Bhutan has had uh, with uh, other countries. Uh, and you can think of, obviously, uh, that there's been advances there in health, and education, communication, and all these things. But um, the concern is, and I'm sure the Bhutanese share this concern, that they don't want to lose their way, lose their culture, uh, and l lose sight of where, uh, where they came from. And so it's terribly important that uh, the, the, not, not only the, the sort of traditions of, uh, but also uh, the, what made up a lot of what I would call normal life uh, in the past is not lost. And that is really, uh, I think, the importance uh, of Karma's book, uh, because uh, he's talking about what's normal. Uh, it's, it's what was normal 60, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, and, and that is uh, something, uh, something that's quite fragile in a way. Uh, that it could be uh, destroyed or subsumed uh, into uh, uh, sort of modern techniques and technology uh, and um, 
so many things which have made life very much easier, but in fact uh, d d d destroy uh, a, a lot of the, the basic way of life. Um, obviously, it's easy to say uh, in a sort of romantic way, oh, they all should go on tilling their fields, jolly hard work, uh, and uh, and no doubt um, the, 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 the profit from any surplus of subsistence uh, is far too small to withstand uh, the influx of products from uh, big scale growing uh, in India or other parts of the world. Um, but uh, it's very important f for Bhutan, and I believe that they realize this, uh, that they uh, don't lose sight of their contact with uh, growing things. Uh, and that is one of the... Um, uh, that is one of my uh, points of contact, certainly. Uh, well, there's there's so much there's so much to uh, see in, in Bhutan, and in our early days, uh, well, we, we once saw uh, some disasters as well as some. Uh, wonderful things. You had accidents from bears who scraped away your face if you encountered them trying to, uh, when you were trying to defend your farm. Uh, just as an example, uh, and, and there were, uh, there was leprosy uh, and um, uh, that was very effectively stamped out, but uh, it was quite a big factor. And then, uh, I suppose, uh, there were always uh, accidents from rather hairy uh, building of or repairing of roofs and putting uh, those big boulders on the, on, on the timbers. Uh, uh, which had to be done rather often. Uh, looked awfully nice, but obviously corrugated iron has displaced that. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you call that an advance or not. I would like to have seen uh, the wood preserved, but uh, uh, it didn't happen that way. So. Uh, turning to the enjoyment one's going to have in turning the pages of Karma's book, uh, there's just such an, a, a wealth of understanding uh, of the way things were. And uh, I think it's very remarkable how it's all held together uh, because you're really talking about things as they were before your time, as much as uh, when I knew it in the 60s and 70s. Um, so uh, it's really very enlightening in that way. And I must say, I think this is a very important bo book uh, to have been written, and it's important for not just us to be uh, have a, a, a better understanding of, of this past, but it's also very important for the Bhutanese themselves uh, because uh, 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 in an urban environment like Timpu, you, you, you could all uh, somehow not be taken into consideration. So, I look forward very much to reading this book and I do congratulate you on a, a tremendous magnum opus uh, and 
uh, I'm so glad that it has all happened. Thank you. Thank you so much um, and for reminding us of the need to keep contact with the soil, um, to celebrate the changes of reduction of bears or leprosy, improvement of roofs, but to recognize that such changes can leave a footprint in culture and soul that also needs to be reflected upon and the role of this book in bringing those memories to life. Our closing commentator is Professor Ulrike Rösler, who is a professor of Tibetan and Himalayan studies in this university. Um, she's been enormously gracious and generous with her wisdom when we were privileged to launch the International Society of Bhutan Studies in this college. Her advice was very vital in sharing with that incipient research community how better to organize, uh, how better to think through the publication and the intellectual journey of this generation of scholars and move forward in that work. And I know that her relationship with this book has been greatly appreciated. So she certainly knows many of these topics, um, has written on them, but perhaps in a different key from different sources, but therefore has a very vi vibrant understanding of the, how this book speaks into a different community. Ulrika. Yeah, thank you very much for letting me take part in, in this occasion. And it's a real honor and a pleasure to conclude the pre-launch of Dashokarma Ura's book. Um, Dashokarma Ura told me that working on this book has taken him three years. It has resulted in two monumental volumes of over 800 pages, I believe. And I think those doing a doctorate at Oxford at the moment can only be jealous because the average doctorate in the humanities would definitely be more than these three years. So I think it's really incredible how you have pulled this together. Um, and the result is really something we can all look forward to. Reading The Unremembered Nation, one can sense that writing this book has been a labor of love. The book is not the account of a bystander, but of a participant. It is offered to His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Bhutan, as a living memory of Bhutan as it was, and an account of someone who has experienced it. With the unremembered nation, Karma Ura has delivered a rich and masterful panorama of Bhutan. The chapters are thoroughly researched and full of fascinating details. We've already heard about some of them. I would like to highlight two aspects that I personally find particularly striking. The first is the internal organization of the book. While most studies of Himalayan societies and indeed of societies around the world would begin with the official account of history, politics, prominent figures, Karma Uda has adopted the opposite perspective. He begins with a small scale and everyday experiences that people have in their everyday lives, and thus he puts human life at the center. The two volumes begin with the house and the family, and then they gradually zoom out to look at the village, the landscape, travel and trade, and only then we get the larger picture of government and politics, art, religion, and monastic culture, culminating in the chapter on the towering figure of Guru Rinpoche or Padmasambhava. Everything in this book emerges from the lived, lived experiences of the people of Bhutan, and the human communities are the center around which everything else revolves, which I think makes this book very special. The other aspect I want to highlight are the numerous descriptions of how humans perceive their world, and Kama Ura has already mentioned that and given some examples of that. These descriptions are exquisite, subtle, and sensuous. Chapters on sound and colors and the rich illustrations not only convey the personal experience of the author, but also immerse the reader 
in Bhutan's beauty and the sensory experience of its environment. For example, a whole subchapter is dedicated to the sounds of wind and water. And I'd like to read just a short passage to illustrate the richness of these descriptions. I quote, If people lived higher up in the glades, it was the sound of strong, fresh and cool wind rustling through the trees that was the ever-present background. Wind, known as Hiserlungma in Zonka, cooled everything it caressed, and it was thus often qualified with the adjective Hiser, the cool or the cooling wind. On the other hand, if people lived closer to a river, it was the sound of the river down below that became the encompassing note in the place. Rivers and streams got louder in summer with swelling volume of currents, while wind got louder in winter because of less sound absorbance like tree foliage and shrubs. Wind was highly visible twice a year. From the first lunar month to the third lunar month, the spring wind seized against the houses and loosened and ruffled any weak parts of their shingle roofs. It was so different from the autumn wind that gently swayed the stands of golden paddy in the terraces. And I'll stop here. I hope it just gives you a bit of a flavor of, of these descriptions and how it really immerses you in this environment. And so I, I'm sure we all look very much forward to reading more when the book becomes available in the summer. The sounds of nature are nowadays inevitably joined and sometimes overpowered by the sounds of modern life, such as cars and airplanes. That the experience of Bhutan as it was might soon be unremembered, as the title of the book suggests, gives the description a certain poignancy. In times of rapid change, memories of the past become even more precious, as we can only move into the future in a meaningful way if we understand where we come from. As Robert Heinlein, the author of a famous utopian novel, has phrased it, a generation which ignores history has no past and no future. In that sense, the unremembered nation is not primarily a memory of things long gone. It is a gift for future generations. These two volumes will be a treasure trove of knowledge for academic scholars, for Bhutan lovers, and perhaps most importantly, for the people of Bhutan. It's heartening to see such thorough scholarship combined with such deep dedication and affection for Bhutan and its culture. And I'd like to congratulate you, Dr. Kama Uda, on completing the books, completing the manuscript, and we look very much forward. And I thought I should do that the traditional way. <laughs> <laughs>